Welcome to Are You Real, episode 43 with Elisa DeLorenzo. Welcome to Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You, the podcast that focuses on Christians that are active in everyday life. Join in as we speak to everyone from successful business owners to educators to athletes about their faith and how it helps them reach out and revolutionize those around them to do the same. And now, get ready to roar with your host, the voice of manifestation, John Fuller. Hey, Roar Nation, John Fuller here, and I am excited today for today's special guest, Elisa DeLorenzo. Elisa, you fired up, ready to roll. I am so fired up. All right, let's do this. So, Elisa De Lorenzo is a sought-after international marriage coach, speaker, and best-selling author, and the co-host of One Extraordinary Marriage Show, which is downloaded in 180 countries. The author of The Trust Factor, Connect Like You Did When You First Met, and Seven Days of Sex Challenge are in the hands of couples worldwide. She and her husband, Tony, have two kids and live in San Diego. You can learn more at OneExtraordinaryMarriage.com. All right, Elisa, I have barely scratched the surface and talking a little bit. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, we go back. If you go back to episode five, mm -hmm. you can check out. Uh, I, I actually interviewed you and Tony, which was my very first dual episode, which was ah. that was awesome. And I absolutely loved it. I was a little nervous. I wasn't sure how that was going to roll. You guys did a great job. Thank you. But today we're going to talk about you have a book that is uh, actually when this comes out, your book would have launched uh, so we can check it out. So I want to dive into your book. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, the book is entitled Called to Love, Experiencing Your Best Marriage Through the Words of Jesus. And it's a 40 day journey of healing and restoration of finding the extraordinary in your marriage and using the gospels as that launching off point, all of Jesus's interactions, not all, many of Jesus's interactions to really start to lay out a blueprint, a manual for your marriage. Wow. I love, I love what you said. I had to write that down. Find the extraordinary. I think um, so many times in our marriages or even just in relationships in general, it's easy to nitpick and find the little things that bug us. Oh yes. Because we're looking for them. And uh, when you said find the extraordinary, I think a lot of times if we would just change our perspective and look for the gold in our marriage and our relationships, it would change our perspective and even the dynamic of the relationship. Absolutely. And you know, if you think about it, that's really what Jesus did. Right. He went looking for the good in people. He, you know, one of the examples I use is the story of Zacchaeus. You know, here's this man who hated by everybody, tiny little guy, you know, has to climb up into a tree and Jesus stops and sees him yes. right, and draws attention to him. Not because he was the greatest guy, not because he was, you know, the hero of the community, but really because of what he had done that wasn't so good. And, and Jesus went looking for it and said, and immediately in that interaction, Zacchaeus had a change of heart. Yeah, because you look for the good. Absolutely. It, it's just the, the change of perspective. So give me the inspiration for you for writing this book. What, why did you write this book? To be really honest, John, I didn't want to write the book. Okay. Uh, it was one of those things where I was sitting at a women's conference a couple of years ago here in San Diego and really heard the audible voice of God saying, you need to go back and look at the gospels. And, you know, here I am the product of 11 years of Catholic education. I'm like, I'm pretty sure God, I've got the gospels down, right? You know, I remember, you know, immaculate conception, you know, left in the temple, walked on water, water into wine, all that good stuff, right? Like I got it. And it turned into this wrestling match, which I should have known if I was wrestling with God, I probably wasn't going to win, but I still dug my heels in anyhow. I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, I got it. And, you know, I finally just said, okay, you know what, I'll go back and I'll go back and read the gospels, right? Like, I don't think I can learn anything new, but okay. And what I started seeing in that encounter, those multiple encounters, I said, go back and read the gospels is, you know, the very thing that I've been looking for, you know, as a marriage coach, I'm constantly telling couples, you know, you didn't get the manual to your spouse on the day you got married, right? Nobody gave me Tony 101 um, you know, October 5th, 1996. I really wish his mom and dad had handed me that book. I would have loved to have short, 
you know, taken a shortcut to a lot of the mistakes that we made in the early years of our marriage. And what I saw as I was reading the gospels is here was the manual I'd been looking for. Wow. Right? Here was the manual on how to do marriage. And literally I feel like it had been under my nose the whole time. I, I love that. So tell me more a little bit. What was the first kind of moment that you had? Tell me something in there out of your book that you caught. Well, you know, I, I started just when it, the book st- first started kind of taking shape, I would just, you know, literally open my Bible and kind of like say, OK, you know, God, where am I supposed to go today? And I landed on the story of the Good Samaritan. And I start reading the story about how the priest and the Levite were like, yeah, you know, we see you over there. You've been beaten. You've, you're hurt. Um, things are really bad for you. And they're like, you know what? We're not getting involved in your mess. We're going to walk to the other side. Right. Walk on by, walk on by, ignore you. You know, we don't have the answers. We're not going to take care of it. And then the Samaritan comes and the Samaritan who shouldn't have been the one to help is the one to help. And I thought, how many times have I been the priest or the Levite in my marriage? How many times have I looked at Tony and said, you know what? I know you're going through something, but I'm not getting involved in this. Like, this is your problem. And it was in that moment that I started to really see the book take shape because I thought if I caught this out of this one little story. You know, I think it's like four, four verses. If I caught this, what else, what else is there to be caught out of the words of Jesus? And that's really when the book started to gain momentum. Okay. I want to ask you this. So we've all been, I I say we all, if you've been married for a day, um, (laughs) you've been to this point where you're just, you're mad at your spouse. Like you talk about being the priest or Levite, you don't feel like doing anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because of resentment or whatever. How do I get over that? I mean, I've been there and I have, but for our listeners or maybe somebody that's going through that right now, you know, I don't feel like it because I'm mad because it's kind of like I'm keeping a score or a tally. So, so they did me one wrong and I know you need help and I know you're going through a hard time, but I'm not going to, cause you did me wrong. Walk me through that process. Well, I want to share with you an image that I shared with one of my clients dealing specifically around this idea of resentment and unforgiveness. And, you know, this is a couple that had been working on their marriage and kept coming up against the same wall. In in this case, the wife was the one holding the resentments and the husband, you know, he's telling me what he's doing. I'm thinking, if you were doing that in my house, like I'd be jumping over backwards because that would be, wow. I mean, it was just like so much. And so I was having a conversation with the wife and she's like, I just don't see his actions. Right. I, I'm still keeping score. Like you said, still keeping score. And I said, and I got this image and it was it's seriously a download from God. But I got this image that she was holding onto this little jar of resentment in her heart. Nothing crazy. It wasn't like, you know, a dump truck full of resentment. It was just this tiny little jar. And every once in a while, she would just crack it open just the tiniest bit. And yet it was like Pandora's box where just that little crack of open would literally flood her system with all of the all of that negativity, all of that toxicity of, you know, I'm going to one up you, you hurt me, you know, I can't let go of this. And so it really became an exercise for her. And I've done this with many of my clients of walking through, giving the gift of forgiveness, of remembering, and this is actually another, um, another day in the book where, you know, Jesus hung on that cross. And in this moment of excruciating pain, he looked to God and said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And so often, when our spouses hurt us, even when we think, well, they did that on purpose in that moment, they don't really understand. None of us really understands when we hurt somebody else, the full implications of the pain that we're causing. And if Jesus could hang on the cross and say, father, forgive them. And he knew like he knew everything and he still asked for our forgiveness. That's the model that we have to be striving toward because We didn't know in that moment. And he still asked for forgiveness for each one of us. So what do you say to that person that that hears those words and they're like, yeah, but I just don't feel like it. Like, it's just, it's too hard. I've been in that place where I thought it was too hard. What do you say? What do you say to that? I say we need to start because holding on to the resentment and it's baby steps. You know, it's like I, I have told clients in the past, I said, you know, for those of you that have kids had kids or, you know, have at least seen a baby. Um, you don't even have to have your own. You've seen babies. You know that they're not born with the ability to run, right? There's a lot of effort going from being a brand new, you know, one minute old baby to that two-year-old that's like tearing around the playground. 
it happened in these tiny little incremental steps. And that's where you start with bringing forgiveness. That's, you know, first it starts with the choice. I may not want to, but I know that my, I know that my model in Jesus is to forgive. So I need to make a decision that I'm going to forgive. I need to make a decision that, you know, in the argument that we have today, I'm not going to bring up something that happened 20 years ago. I've done that. You know, I need to make the decision. And it's all about decisions. A lot of people get stuck in these places of resentment or unforgiveness because they really kind of adopt this victim mentality. Well, this was done to me, so I can't do anything about it. And the truth is, is that you and I, John, we have decisions to make in every encounter with our spouses. How are we going to show up? And if you want to break free, then you need to change how you're showing up. It, it's funny you said that. I was just thinking about, I recently went and watched uh, the movie The Shack, which is mm-hmm. obviously, it can be controversial for some people. But there's this moment where McKinsey is with uh, God and they're sitting there and he tells him, he says, uh, in the reference, they're talking about forgiveness. They don't say that, but you just know what he's referencing. And he looks at God, looks at McKinsey and God the Father and says, it's not that you can't, it's because you won't. Or he says something like that because he has a choice. He's like, you can change this whole thing. And he's talking sure. about forgiveness. And and I think so many times we don't realize that, that the power of forgiveness, when we lay that down, how much healing it brings, not just to that person in our relationship, but how much healing it brings to us as individuals. Forgiveness, making the choice to start walking down that path. And it's not an instantaneous thing. It's not something that you do once and you're like, okay, good. I've forgiven you. We're, you know, we're perfect. And it's going to be, you know, rainbows and unicorns from here on out. It's a, a process that you go through day after day and you keep making decisions. But when you do that, I actually think the amazing gift about forgiveness is that it changes you more than it will ever change the relationship or the other person. Yes. Amen to that. You've, you've been given the greatest gift. You've let that anger, that toxicity, that hurt not be a part of the fabric of who you are. And you're a different person. Yes. Okay. I want to ask you this. So it's easy to, I'm going to say, write a book about something, but it's different to write a book about something you've had to live or walk through. <laughs> Uh, right. So, oh, yeah. so there's oh, a yeah. lot of quote, there's a lot of quote unquote experts out there that can give you great advice, but they've never actually walked through it. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask you, what has been a moment that you've had to apply this principle even within within your and Tony's marriage? Well, you know, one of the one of the days that I share, um, you know, the focus of one of the days was you know, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept you know, two words. And I really had to, in that moment, you know, I started thinking about how many times have, have the, have we taken out the ability to show emotion in our marriage? And I was raised in a family, John, where my mom really stuffed a lot of her emotions. And, you know, my mom's a listener to the podcast. She knows I've shared this story many times. So, you know, this is total transparency here. Um, but that was the model that I had. So I got into this place where I did not, you know, I didn't show any emotion to Tony. I would completely, we live in Southern California. I would completely shut down like a power outage. Wow. Right. And get into this place. And I remember distinctly one day, um, where he sat me down on the couch and he said, we're not doing marriage like this. You're going to have to, you're going to have to show up emotionally, right? This whole silent treatment iceberg thing you've got going on. This is not working. Right. And so in that, we really had to work through and get to the point where, you know, it's okay for me to cry or it's okay for me to be angry and know that we've created this safe place in our marriage where emotions can be shared. And the same for Tony. You know, I had to create an environment in our marriage where, you know, if my husband feels pain, he's not any less of a man in my eyes if he actually like cries and shows that pain. And and we walked through that specifically. And, you know, this is one of the examples in the book. Um, Gosh. 2004. So, you know, almost 13 years ago now, holy cow. Um, our son, Andrew was born at 18 weeks and it it was just an incredibly dark period of time. And I went into a depression and, you know, shut down emotionally and, and I couldn't engage Tony because I didn't want to, because I was in my own headspace. But as we were coming out of that journey of about three years, you know, getting to the point where Tony could show me his tears of our son, Andrew, where it wasn't that he had to protect me anymore, that we could heal together because we'd created this environment where showing emotion was okay. 
So I want to ask you this. Did you, because did you have to come to a place, was that, it sounds like it was natural for you to just kind of shut down because that's the way you grew up, I guess. So did you have to make a mental shift or I, I say this is, let me, let me give you an example. Okay. So I'm a very caring person, but I, I naturally don't show a lot of emotion. So my friends mm-hmm. laugh. I joke around. I literally have to, my wife, uh, Casey, she's just amazing. But, uh, she says sometimes she's like, you just need to be nice. And it's mm-hmm. not that I'm this mean jerk. It's just like, I get into this mode of get things done. Sure. And I have to put, I make sticky notes sometimes and I mm-hmm. will put them in my truck that says, just, I need to be nice. And it sounds funny because it doesn't come natural with my personality type and things that I've just realized. I just, I have to make a mental note to slow down and just be nice. Mm-hmm. Was that something that you had to do even within your marriage mentally? Or Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And I think, I think that's an important, you know, lesson strategy for all of your listeners is that if something doesn't come naturally, you can still learn it. You don't have to be like, you know, I mean, I've met a lot of folks, John, who, you know, say th- similar things like what you just said. And they're like, well, that's just the way I am. So I can't change it. Yep. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that there's very little that we can't change about ourselves if there's a desire to do so. I'm laughing that you just said that because I used to make that comment to Casey. I would say, well, that's just the way I am. That's how God made me. And she's like, yeah, but you still have a choice. You can choose to be nice. And that, I love your wife. Yeah, she's like, that might be the way you are or that that might be the way you naturally react, but mm-hmm. you still have a choice to be nice to people. And I'm like, oh, so then I have to completely think about like I usually do, I used to say just whatever would come out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. And now through the Holy Spirit, I have a filter <laughs> and, a, and a great wife. <laughs> And I have to, I think about things that I say like, oh, that could possibly really hurt that person's feelings. So I should sure. probably either not say it or say it or, or I'll, there's even times I'll ask Casey, I'm like, how would you say this? Like, this is what I'm thinking, but mm-hmm. I need you to translate this for me so it doesn't completely just hurt somebody's feelings. And that's, that's playing to your strengths, right? Like learning to ask Casey that question, you know, God gave you Casey for a reason. Yes. Right. And, and I, I firmly believe that in that, you know, to become one, which is actually the first day in the book, when I talk about the fact that that's more than just words for your wedding day, you know, you get to this place where God gave you that spouse. If they have strengths you don't have, tap into that. Like, you don't have to, you don't have to learn all this on your own. You know, you asking Casey, Hey, how would you handle this? Okay. Now I can, because it's not natural to you. It's not that second nature. You're like, okay, well, if this is how my wife would do it. And you know, that's kind of a nice reaction. Let me, you know, I'll tweak this and make it John's, but I've got the Casey blueprint to start with. Yes. You know, what's funny is I think at least for us, but I'm sure you do in marriage counseling, you've, you've noticed we've been married uh, 18 years now. And, And what I've noticed is, is like for the first, I don't know, like 10 years, it seemed like forever. So the things that you need the most from your spouse are the things that you despise. (laughs) <laughs> so it's like, I hate this about them or they're this or they're that because it's the opposite of who you are. And mm-hmm. it's the very thing that you need in your life. It's like God puts you together to say you need these qualities from your spouse. And uh, it took us years to figure out. I, I always joke around and I say that most people had the honeymoon phase for uh, their first couple years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, we went through like hell on earth phase. <laughs> Because we had so many issues to work through that we just had to run to the father and say, God, how do I like we made one commitment. We fought like cats and dogs, but we made one commitment. We we said, uh, come hell or high water, we were going to stay together no matter what. But divorce, but divorce wasn't an option. So it was either we could either live together and just hate each other or we were going to figure out how to make this work. And uh, it just took us a lot of years to figure out that like, hey, you're, you're the things that I don't like about you are actually the very things that I need. Mm-hmm. So, and that's, uh, that's God's wisdom. Yeah, you know, yeah. When, when we're, when we're seeking him, when we're really bringing him into the center of our marriage and, and seeking him in decisions and, and seeking him when things aren't going well, you know, it's so easy to be like, yay, God, <clears throat> 
excuse me, yay, God, you know, this is going well. And, and then we kind of check out of that relationship. We're like, all right, well, you know, we're, we're doing good on our own. And yet then we, you know, bump up against a crisis and we're like, God, fix my spouse. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that most of the time it's not about fixing them. Oh, it's yeah. about fixing us. Absolutely. You know, and looking at that man or woman in the mirror and saying, God, show me, give me the wisdom to know what I need to do in this place. Right. Yeah. Let me work on me first. You know, it's, uh, there's another day where um, I couldn't avoid the the conversation about, you know, take that plank out of your eye. Don't worry about the speck in your brother's eye. Worry about the plank in your own eye. And that's really what you're describing here. You know, it's so easy for us to be like, you need to fix this or you need to fix that when really we got to take care of the stuff in our own lives. Yeah, absolutely. I had, I think I had logs in both of my eyes <laughs> when I was looking at her specs. Yeah, so, yeah. that's so normal, John. I, I, Tony probably has a million and one examples of me doing that too. So love it. Love it. Okay. So I want to ask you, why did you guys get into marriage ministry or the marriage, the whole concept? So you guys have, uh, I actually found you through a friend uh, a couple years ago, uh, One Extraordinary Marriage, which uh, listeners, I highly could not recommend more. You guys crack me up. I actually I get a great laugh out of listening to you guys as well. Thank you. Uh, and applying practical, very everyday practical knowledge to my marriage. But why did, tell me a little bit of the journey of why you guys decided to get into the podcast, but also even writing your book. So the journey to get into the podcast, and we now, we've been podcasting for seven years. Um, yeah, so we, we reached a milestone earlier this year in that we now have an episode for every day. You know, so if somebody just wanted to listen to one episode a day, we've got one for every day of the year now. Uh, but that journey really grew out of the fact that, you know, come year 11, we've now been married 20 plus years, come year 11, things were not good. We, you know, like you and Casey, we had decided that divorce wasn't an option, but it was looking really attractive because we were living as roommates. Our kids were little. There wasn't a lot of connection between the two of us. And, and while it wasn't a viable option, we're kind of like, all right, well, we're sort of dancing around that. We're dancing around this idea of being roommates until the baby, you know, gets older. Like, how do we just kind of coexist or do we get radical? And divorce wasn't an option. I didn't want to just tolerate my life for the next 50 years. So the roommate option wasn't a good one. And so that only left doing something radical. And that's where, you know, Tony, my wonderfully handsome big idea guy threw out us doing the 60 days of sex challenge, um, you know, almost 10 years ago now. And we did, we completed 40 out of 60 days. And that's really, as we started sharing that story, people kept asking us, you know, what's next, what's next. And I'm thinking I've done every, like, I just did 40 out of 60 days. What do you want from me? And people are like, but, but the insights that you gained, how do we get those? And that started to a business coach saying, Hey, you need to get on blogging. And this was eight years ago. And I'm like, blogging's hard. If we have to come up with all this fresh content all the time, I can't. like hats off to the, to the bloggers who are putting out fresh content every day. You guys are my heroes. Um, but we, Tony would listen to podcasts. And so one day he's like, we should start a podcast. And this was honestly, you know, one of those wife humor your husband moments. Cause I'm like, that's fine, honey, whatever you want to do. And so he goes and buys the equipment and sits in our hallway for two months in this big cardboard box. And I'm like, is that really something we're going to use? Or is it just the most expensive paperweight that I've ever bought? Like, where are we going with this? And so finally, January of 2010, he pulls out the box of equipment and we sit down and we record our first show, which I think probably took us five or six takes. Like, I wish we had video of that. I wish we had known then that we were still going to be around seven years to get video of that first day. But it was really people were asking us, you know, like, what, what, how can we have a marriage like you guys? And we're like, we're not perfect. Like, let's be really clear. We're not perfect. We've just made a decision to be intentional. And to keep working at it, to not think that we've ever arrived. And so that was, that's how the podcast started. I really thought we were only going to do 10 episodes. And as of when you and I are recording this conversation, we've just recorded episode 368. So a few more than 10. Um, and then the book too, you know, we've written numerous books, but this book was one where I I'd never really felt so compelled to, to say, you know, we need to address we need to get Jesus back into marriage. And 
we need to equip couples with what Jesus has to say about marriage, because I think so many people look at the words in the Bible and they're like, okay, that's a nice book. Yay. But how does that impact me? And because we've, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that our mission is to impact a million marriages around the world. Like we know. And so in doing that, we just keep stepping out because we don't know. I mean, like we're so, it's such a blessing to me to hear how you listen to the podcast and actually take those practical tips and ideas. Cause I'm like, Oh, there's one only, you know, 999,999 to go. But we never know who's marriage. And so we just keep going. We keep producing new books. We keep producing new programs, new podcasts, because marriage is under attack everywhere. And we've got it. We've got to be an antidote. One of the antidotes out there to all of the attacks that are coming against marriage. You know, what's funny is you said, you know, talking about blogging and stuff like that, people creating fresh content. You know, what's funny about that is for some listeners, it, it is new and fresh, okay? And then for mm-hmm. others, like for me, like I hear you guys say stuff and it's not even that it's new and fresh, that it's, I need to be reminded sure. uh, of those things. And I think people need to realize that. And I'm, and I'm just saying that to myself and even to encourage you guys, like it doesn't have to be this new, fresh revelation. It's like, sometimes I just need to go back to basics. You know, yeah. just even like within sports, I played uh, football in college and I did things, you know, it was never about the game. It was about practice. And mm-hmm. we did the same stupid things over and over and over uh, to prepare us for the game. That's so good. And I think a lot of times we just need to go back to basics. And what came to my mind is you said the word be intentional. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times we're not intentional about our marriages in, in, in our relationships. But I want to ask you, what is something that you would give um, our listeners, what does being intentional look like in a marriage? Like, what do you tell people? Well, practically everyone that's listening to your show right now has their phone, I'm guessing, within five feet of where they are. Let's see. Hold on. Let me reach out. We are two feet away. Okay, good. Um, Because I know mine's within arm's reach right now as I'm sitting here at the computer. We keep that device everywhere we go. And most people nowadays actually use the calendar on that device to structure everything in their lives, right? It it just, it dings with alerts all day long. And and so one of the strategies that I use with all of my coaching couples, we talk about on the show is your spouse should be the most important relationship, which means they actually need to make it onto that calendar. Whether it's date nights, whether it's a coffee break with them, whether it's, you know, just time to have a conversation, you know, 10 minute check in, you know, a couple times a week, whether it's we're going to go for a walk, you know, two or three, I've got one of my coaching clients, they get out to walk two or three times a week just because the fresh air and the movement and everything away from the kids at night, it's dark. They can just be themselves, get out of the craziness of the house and just connect. So it's all about putting the most important, I mean, we've got everything on there, you know, kids, sports schedules, doctor's appointments, meetings with clients, get your spouse on your calendar. It will change your marriage. Mm, That's good. It's funny. You said that it's like, you know, that it's another one of those things, you know, that, or you should, but then you get in the routine of kids and sports and life and you just start doing Mm-hmm. And you don't make time for things. And instead of being in control of your life, you let life control you. Right. So, so true. Awesome advice. Okay. So what do you feel like your biggest strength is as a coach? And with this book you've written, what's your biggest gift and strength? I think my biggest gift and strength, uh, and I've, I've heard it time and time and again from coaching clients, is I'm able to really look at that 30,000 foot view and then dial it in so specifically to what a couple needs and, and to speak their language. It's really interesting. I find myself um, sometimes getting it off of a coaching call going, where did that analogy come from? Right. Like somebody will tell me just like you did uh, a few minutes ago that you played football in college. And so like, I'll start talking about their marriage and all of a sudden all of these football analogies come flying out of my mouth. Right. Or I've had people that, you know, are into motorcycles and we're talking about, you know, motors, like all of these different things, which I know some things about, but not as much as like God just kind of does these downloads that allows me to speak to somebody's heart where they're passionate about. I can bring in marriage and marry their passion with their relationship 
so that we can get breakthrough. Totally dig it. So I want to ask you this. This doesn't totally apply to you as a coach, but it applies to your marriage. What do you feel like your biggest weakness is? Well, I guess, yeah, as a coach, that what's your biggest weakness that God is a lot like where Tony's able to step in and you guys are able to do this together as a team? Well, it's definitely a unique situation working in the marriage world with your husband. Um, you know, because one of, I think one of our weaknesses as a couple is that there's really not always a clear break for Tony and I, because like, we'll be going through something ourselves and we're like, Oh, that'd be a great podcast. Like we don't ever, oh, don't, not <laughs> but I mean, like we go on vacation and something happens and we're like, not like, Oh, that's a horrible thing to happen on vacation. We're like, where's the podcast in this? Where's the book? Where's the article? Right. Because we're constantly thinking in that vein. And so one of the things that Tony and I have really had to do um, over the last couple of years is get intentional about having that time that we're not, we're not just focusing on everybody else's marriage, but also looking at our marriage. Yeah. Right. Because when you, when everything that you do revolves around marriage, both in your personal life and in your professional life, sometimes that line can get blurred. And Tony's really good about just being like, you know what, we just need time for us, you and me. And he's my sounding board. He doesn't do any of the coaching. Um, but he allows me to just kind of talk through and just give me a different perspective. If I'm, you know, finding a challenge. I'm like, okay, how would you, it's kind of like what you do with Casey. Like, how would you handle this? And I'm like, how would you handle this? And, and just having his feedback allows me to go back and craft, you know, the next session with a client or send an email follow-up saying, Hey, you know what? Had some thoughts around this. And, and so he really becomes just that amazing sounding board when I'm stuck, you know, knowing, and he responds very well to, I need you to listen. I just, I just need listening ears or I need you to help me solve this. And that's another area where we've had to work to, so that I'm clear so that he's not frustrated in communication. Yeah. I like that. Um, we're actually about Casey and I, when we first got married, we owned a restaurant and a health food store for seven years together. And, uh, uh and I tried, uh, when we've had multiple businesses like you guys, uh, but when we sold that one, I tried to hire her as a secretary to help me with our construction company, all the other things we do. And she's just like, I will not work with you anymore because I get so task driven that sure. I'm like, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. And the relationship side sometimes gets put to the side because I'm thinking about a task and not right. about everything. And it's funny, but we are actually after all these years, uh, she does, um, uh, fitness, online fitness stuff, uh, with women and we do coaching as well. Like we're starting to come back together, working together. And it's really a unique, I love working with her. I, I can see those strengths, but it's, uh, it's totally a, like you, like you said, you need a break yeah. and, and it's really seeing that and saying, okay, we not just need a break, but also work off each other's strengths and weaknesses. So. Absolutely. And when couples start to do that, it's amazing the breakthrough that they have when they start playing to each other's weakness or playing to each other's strengths, because it's just like what we said at the very beginning of this interview, you know, what you look for, you're going to find. So if you look for your spouse's strengths and you can speak life into them and encourage them, they're going to blossom and, yeah. and you're going to see such amazing breakthrough that you couldn't even imagine if you had just kind of kept all of those thoughts to yourself. Tell them how wonderful they are. Tell them when you see them. I mean, it's like when Tony goes out to work in the morning, I'm like, hey, go slay a few dragons today. Right. Go and like storm the castle. Right. That's what I expect for him. And that's what I speak over him because I know I'm sending him out into the, you know, I'm like, go do this. And it's just that encouragement of saying, I believe that you can do this. I know you can. And I expect that it's going to happen today. Amen to that. Um, what is a personal daily habit that you do you do or that you would recommend to our listeners to have just a solid marriage? So this is something that I've only recently started probably in the last four to six months. And, you know, it's something I've heard year in and year out in church. It's something that um, I, I like I can't tell you how many times I've heard a pastor say this, but really carving out that time to start my day with God. And, you know, it, I, I won't say I'm perfect at this, but I, I shoot for five out of seven. 
And it's amazing how when I come to God with the first part of my day and really, you know, as, as we've been preparing for the launch of this book, really being focused on what does that look like for marriage and getting, you know, my head screwed on straight with God first thing in the morning and thinking about how does that impact my marriage? You know, God, what should I be praying for, for Tony? Um, the stuff that I know, the stuff that I don't know, right? Because, you know, let's face it, we don't tell our spouses everything if we're dealing with stressful situations and whatnot. And so just praying over him, being in that place of prayer to say, you know what, I'm just going to start. And maybe it's five minutes. If you can carve out five minutes to pray for your marriage, you will see breakthrough. If you can just ask God to open your eyes to what you need to do, where you need to show up again, it goes back to talking about the planks versus the specs. Um, you know, God, what planks do I need to remove? What's keeping me? Where am I being greedy? You know, one of the days in the book talks about being greedy. Where am I being greedy in my marriage with my time or with my spouse's time or, you know, with whatever it is? And how can I not be greedy towards my spouse? How can I serve them? What field do I need to harvest to bring in, you know, the crop for our marriage? What do I need to do? And when we start going to God and saying, what do I need to do, God? And we take it off of God fix my spouse that's a prayer that God will always answer. And the more we start asking what we need to change, that's where, you know, I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my relationship with Tony and how we pray together. Amazing transformation is happening in that place. Yeah, man. I just, I was just thinking about just anytime you've been married for any length of time, you can just think back about all the ups and the downs in your marriage. And, and honestly, out of all the hard times, whether it was Casey or myself, but the first one to just say, Hey, I'm sorry, let's mm-hmm. figure this out and work through it. It just defuses sure. uh, everything and it makes it so much easier. Absolutely. So, okay. I want to ask you, give us the title of your book again, and then where are we going to find you? Cause I'm excited for, by the time this releases, you'll have been launched. So I'm excited. Yay. Um, where do we find it and what's the name? So the name of the book is called to love experiencing your best marriage through the words of Jesus. And you can learn all about it. If you just go to called to love that's, that will take you to, you know, kind of giving you a little, you'll see the video trailer. You'll see, you know, just what other people are saying about the book. I'll have links for you to be able to buy it. Everything will be right there at called to love Okay. And you have more than just one book. You guys have a ton of resources, lots of stuff. Give my listeners a little bit more of that because all of us could uh, use some more stuff about either relationships or marriage. Absolutely. And one of the things that Tony and I, you know, is we've been doing the podcast um, and coaching for the last, well, the podcast seven years now, coaching for probably the last four or five, is we really start to pick up on where are people saying their needs are. So we've written books and have resources on sex on trust, on communication, because those are the top three that pretty much everything else seems to revolve around, right? You know, we're having problems with finances. Okay, that's probably trust and communication. We're having problems in the bedroom. Okay, communication and sex, maybe trust. Um, and so we, we've we built out so much stuff. All of those resources are at oneextraordinarymarriage.com. Um, that's our hub. You can get links to the podcast there. Um, you can reach out and connect with us. That's that's the place to go to find all of those other resources. Okay. I want to ask you this. So how old were you when you and Tony got married? I was 22. Tony was 23. Okay. So if you get to go back, well, you do get to go back to the 22 year old version of you. Okay. What advice would you tell yourself at 22, uh, knowing what you're going to go through? Now you can't change anything. Nothing's going to change, but you can give yourself solid advice. What, what are you going to tell yourself? Don't take yourself so seriously. I, I tend to be the one that is um, hypercritical. I tend to be the one that will replay something over and over and over and over again. And um, if I could, to- I could have told that 22-year-old girl that, yeah, you're going to go through a lot, but he's going to be solid. He is solid. He's coming through all of this with you. I probably would have lightened up a little bit more in those early years. That's good advice. Uh, It doesn't matter if you've been married a year or 20 years. That's great advice right there. Mm -hmm. So, so, okay. So as we start to part, I want to ask you, what is one last piece of parting advice? You've given us a ton and and thank you so much. I appreciate that. But I do want to ask you, what is one piece of advice that you would give our listeners just in general about relationships and marriage that they could take away today? 
the one piece of advice um, that I like to share with couples, whether I've just met or I've been working with them for a while, is that your two best friends when you're creating an extraordinary marriage are going to be transparency and consistency. And to just take that, you know, a step further is that learning how to be transparent and, you know, under that falls vulnerability and, and communication, all this learning how to be transparent allows your heart to be connected to your spouse's heart because there are no more masks. There's no facade. There's no guessing games or any kind of games. And then the consistency factor is really, you know, be consistent in how you treat them, be consistent in, you know, honoring your word, be consistent in honoring them as a person, that consistency, when they know that they can count on you and they know that you will be transparent with them, you'll have an extraordinary marriage. Amen to that. So, all right, guys, uh, listeners, get on and check out our resource page. I will have links and everything going to One Extraordinary Marriage. You can check them out, number one, in iTunes. They're phenomenal. I listen to them, so I definitely endorse them. Uh, go to areyoureal.org. And, guys, please rate and review us. Uh, send us some love. Share it to friends. And if you know anybody who needs marriage help, advice, anything, Pick up the book, send them a book, and check out One Extraordinary Marriage. So guys and gals, we love you. And remember, be real, be authentic, and be you. God bless. That's all for this episode of Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You. Be sure to go to areyoureal.org for your free questionnaire to identify your gifts and talents and how you can use them to help people become leaders and catapult them into their destiny to help others become the leaders of tomorrow. We appreciate you spending your time with us and look forward to helping you reach out and revolutionize next time on Are You Real? Finding the Authentic You.